Uh, I'm going to talk to you about automated refactoring. Uh, so I have a robot. This is a robot on the screen. And the robot says, fixing bad code is tedious and repetitive. Tedious and repetitive work is for computers to do. Therefore, if there's bad code to fix, surely the computers should be the ones fixing it. So the solution is to build robots and teach them to write software. Because what could possibly go wrong? And of course, we think about that and we say, great idea. Let's do it. Uh, but you have to walk before you can run. Okay. So step one, walk. Step two, run. So we're going to start with this book, Refactoring, by Martin Fowler. This is an essential book. This will help you become better at programming. And if you've read it, you know that I'm telling the truth. It is crucial. It is all about improving the design of existing code. If there's new functionality, you're not refactoring. Uh, I'm going to go kind of fast over that basic idea, because the long version is just read the book, which is actually not such a long version. Trust me, read it. Uh, so long story short, if there's new functionality, you're not refactoring. Term is often misused, but we're using it in the, uh, you know, the precise uh, sense here. So if you're not adding functionality, you're not fixing bugs, why do it? Are you just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Uh, no. Good design is easier to work with. And again, there's much more to it than that, but I only have 45 minutes. So before I talk about automated refactoring, uh, I'm going to show you a surprise. This is probably going to be the first time ever, probably, that you've seen a developer or hacker who is enthusiastic about using spreadsheet software. I am that fluke. <laughs> That's me. Uh, and the reason is spreadsheets are actually incredibly useful for refactoring. Uh, say you have some incomprehensible code, right? And you're looking at it like OMG. WTF, which of course stands for, oh my god, what's this function? <laughs> so you're looking at it, you're here, and you want to get to this other place here called, there I fixed it. You probably want to get further than this. <laughs> you probably want to get much further than this, but first you want to get at least that far. And the good news is you have specs or tests, whatever. You have spec-driven design or TDD and a spreadsheet. And you don't actually have to use spreadsheet software at this stage. It does become useful. This is an ASCII spreadsheet that I generated by writing code which analyzes code. Um, wait, that's not accurate. I have one of those in another slide. This is one I wrote by hand after tweaking code and just seeing what happened. Sorry. Uh, I went through, I had this incomprehensible uh, file. Um, and you can see the lines changed column. Can you see my mouse? OK, cool. The lines changed column over here. I started at line 46 and basically went all the way down to 61, 60, maybe 60, before I got tired of it and just cut to 11.9 and 120, or I guess 119 and 120, which is where I thought you know, the worst trouble would be. And I got lucky because that's where it was. Um, I went through this incomprehensible method. I had a whole bunch of specs. They weren't very good, but they were very comprehensive. So what I did is I just deleted arbitrary lines of, of code from the software, ran the specs, and then saw how many times uh, this, how many failures these deletions caused. And you can see that some of the lines, you know, I didn't bother with white space lines, right? Some of the lines only caused like one little failure. And it was no big deal, uh, whereas others caused multiple failures. And I also differentiated between changes in all specs right, versus changes in the individual spec that I was interested in. Um, I'm pointing over here, by the way, because I can see that screen if I, if I work at it. And I'm just assuming this screen shows the same thing. So if you see me pointing here and you decide to look there, that's fine. Uh, anyway, obviously, some of these lines were more significant than the others, right? 37 and 18, I got 37 spec fails by changing this one line of code versus above it, zero, uh, you know, zero changes. So there's one line of code that I could just change and nothing would, uh, you know, would result. 
So looking at this code, it was really easy to find the most significant lines in the method. All right? And the good news is, you know, this type of analysis can tell you where your code is most brittle. It's really valuable information. Brittleness is a serious problem because it, uh, it causes delays. Anything else you want to change is impeded by this kind of thing. And, and the reason that's the case is because if you have one particular line where every, you know, fail cascades from, then that's the thing to fix first. But of course, uh, the bad news is that's not automated. That's by hand. But yeah, even though the code was incomprehensible, I knew which incomprehensible piece to look at first. And that's one way to get from OMG WTF to there I fixed it. Now, another time, I had a bunch of methods, and I wasn't sure they did anything. Uh, so I wanted to validate that assumption. Uh, I'm talking about some pretty bad code that I was you know, feeling very skeptical about. So I used ACK and WC on the uh, Unix command line. These are two Unix utilities to find the number of times each method appeared in the code base. This is ACK. It finds all the files whose text contains the method name in this particular instance. And this is WC, and it just counts them. So then I had that just, you know, I wrapped that in a little bash function and had it spit out just a little ASCII spreadsheet on the screen, you know, uh, matching the different method names to the number of times they were called. And what I found is that uh, two of the methods were literally useless, as in they did absolutely nothing ever. No use at all. So that was an easy, easy choice. All right. So this is going to lead us to some actual automated refactoring. Sometimes you get incredibly similar code. If you read this code, it is virtually identical. You know, if I zoom on in, it's so identical that it's kind of tricky to figure out the difference in the first place. Although, you know, when I highlight it, it's really easy. All right. So this is where I throw out the text editor and switch to an actual spreadsheet app. And you can just grab them by hand, right? This is a trivial example, right? You say the arg, you have an argument for foo column and an argument to anonymous function column and a file name column, and you track them. And if you have a situation like this with more complex information, which shows a really consistent pattern, then what you're actually doing is surfacing an implicit object model. There's an object model where it's just being passed around as a blob of data. And there, there's a term for this in, in refactoring in the book. Uh, I forgot what it, what it is. It's something like blob of data. But it basically means if you see like 30 different functions that are all passing around the same blob of data, you've got an object and you are using an object, but you're being overly verbose because you haven't you know, yet named it and identified it. So if you can put together a spreadsheet like this with this kind of consistency, you know, with much more stuff in it, that consistency indicates the implicit object model and means that you can not only make the code terser, but also easier to understand. So this is Ruby, but I think it will serve as a good example because all you have to do, you don't even need to know Ruby or any of that. You just need to be able to spot the similarity, right? And clearly, there's an argument called controller, which always has a value called home. Argument called action, which always has a value called new build. Right? So you could easily wrap that up in some kind of like bill home object that just you know, turned itself into a hash of those arguments. Uh, you could also use factory methods, which is uh, a function that would return that hash. Uh, <laughs> you also see code like this sometimes uh, when you're dealing like, ha has anyone had to deal with a lot of cut and paste code where it has this kind of fractal similarity where you're like, oh, I've seen these, you know, 10 lines of logic before and a completely different function over here. Yeah? Yeah, okay. I see uh, just, just a, a, a timid hand or two, but quite a lot of knowing smiles. So I'll take that as a yes. Okay. So... What I did, uh, and, and I'm going to show you this in more detail soon, um, in order to prep an automated refactoring process is return these little lines here, right? You can see in the first window, uh, there are these 
parametric differences that I talked about before, where in one case it's bar and in one case it's baz, right? And then there's these also these just random lines that don't actually need to be there once development is finished, right? So you just chop those out and you have something very, very similar to the other function. So once upon a time, I created a spreadsheet like this, and then I went in and found all these little meaningless variations and eliminated, the, eliminated them by hand. Uh, and then I wrote code, which went in and worked against these implicit objects to pull out the values of those hashes to create these little object creating sentences or you know, commands. And this simple process removed a thousand lines of code in a week with no changes in functionality. Because automated refactoring is much faster and refactored code is more readable. So going back to the spreadsheet thing, this is the abstract version. I'm going to give you some more specifics. This was UI code for modal windows, modal overlays. This is a very, very common use case for front-end JavaScript, which is the majority of JavaScript, I think. So it ended up looking something like this. New modal overlay, 600 pixels, blue. So you may be wondering, here's the robot pretending to be you guys. That's cool, but you did most of it by hand. Where's the code? And unfortunately, the answer is NDA. Uh, I don't have the code anymore. Um, however, uh, first, there will be code later. First, I can tell you how it works in detail. Uh, number one, know your code base. You have to be able to, to, you have to work around in there for a while to get a sense of what's going on. You have to be able to say we have this specific chunk of repetitive code to get rid of when you start. You have to choose a broken pattern to fix. And by that, I don't mean design pattern. I mean you're looking at the actual text in these files. And even if you were a robot that had no understanding of language, you would simply be able to say, you know, this character, this character, they all appear in sequence very often. Once you've done that, you then want to scan your code base. Um, I use uh, the Unix command line quite a lot. I know there are IDE approaches to this, but for me, it would be grep or awk or ag, uh, one of these command line tools. And what you're simply looking for is instances of the pattern. And what you'll probably find is if you say, I've got this one pattern, I'm going to eliminate this one pattern and squash it down, you'll actually find that there are a lot of permutations of the pattern, yet it is also likely, uh, depending on the nature of your code base, those permutations can often just be permutations in style, right? Like you will find, you know, say you've got um, some function that has been, you know, copy pasted and tweaked 50 times, right? So that's a lot of times. So you'd expect a fair amount of variation there. What you'll actually find is that in my intuition and in my experience, although I cannot say for an absolute fact is what every single one of you will absolutely find, but what you will mostly find is that most of the variations are stylistic variations that can simply be disregarded. And a few of the variations are semantic variations like, you know, 90% of the time we're making a modal overlay, but this one time we're making an alert or something like that. So basically, you scan the code base and you build up a spreadsheet of all these files that have this pattern and any permutations of the pattern that stand out. Some of them are going to be important, like there's a comment and just throw the comment away or whatever. And some of the, I'm sorry, some of them are going to be unimportant, like there's a comment. And some will genuinely be unimportant. So you write down what you fix in the spreadsheet. Document it very specifically. And here you have, you know, shopping cart JS has 800 pixels and the color is blue. Product.js has 600 pixels and the color is red. So those are like function parameters. So you simply parameterize what is hard coded there. You look at your spreadsheet, you say, here are some parameters. I'll just need to plug them into something like this. And then you clean the code by hand, just an itty bitty amount. Uh, like all you do here is you delete these console logs. And then you write filter scripts. So filter scripts, that's like a script that uh, you can do it in Node.js, for instance. It goes through, opens a file, scans every line in the file, you know, obtains these uh, parameters by scanning the lines, 
and then does string substitution to replace or throw away these lines that it can compress. And filter scripts are really just a hacky way of describing text streams. So those of you who uh, like using Node and its stream-based approach will find a lot to work with there. But text streams, the, the alternative way of saying that is that text streams are just a fancy way of saying what filter scripts do because it doesn't take a lot of work. So the example I'm giving you comes from 2011. I first developed this technique in 1998. Uh, this was the number one movie in 1998, Titanic. This was a very successful band at the time. Uh, Pets.com was still in business. Uh, meanwhile, I was working for a successful startup with a lot of customers, which was actually kind of unusual back in those days. Uh, and we had a redesign, which is we had to rebuild the entire front end. And at the time, I was big into shell scripting and Perl. So shell scripting has this in common with Node.js, which is that it is basically all about streams. So I discovered this filter script technique and transformed or reformatted more than 700 HTML files, a very, very large percentage of which were hand-coded and irregular, in two weeks. And you might want to see that code, even though it's in Perl. But you know, NDAs were even more prevalent back then. So I can't go any further. But I do have some interesting open source stuff that you might be able to get some, <coughs> some mileage from. So let's get into some code. Uh, my first code robot project was called Towly. It is because uh, it likes to make things dry. Uh, <laughs> It, it is of somewhat limited usefulness to us here because it's a Ruby project written in Ruby and which targets Ruby. Uh, it did not have automated refactoring, but what it did have was automated similarity detection, which is to say I could throw, um, you know, I could throw a directory at it and tell me how many of the um, function uh, methods, it's, in Ruby it's all methods, how many of the methods in this folder are duplicated, you know, as in the same method is found in multiple files, right? And that, that was easy, but when I was doing similarity detection of any greater uh, subtlety, like show me how many of these things are similar except they have one word different, uh, then it became slow as hell, uh, which actually, Ruby has gotten a lot faster over the years, but this is generally a problem with, with Ruby projects written in 2008. That's all as hell problem. Um, so a couple years later, 2010, I wrote a blog comment similarity detector in JavaScript. And there's a URL at the bottom. Uh, sorry I didn't make it bigger. Uh, so Discus has this uh, quote unquote feature where if you post a blog post and somebody tweets a link to your blog post, they will register that tweet as a comment on your blog. So if you're, you know, there's one blog post every day that gets like 100 million retweets and everyone's talking about it because it's the, the hot thing of the day. And if you happen to be that blog post and you have discussed comments on your blog, or this might not be true, I'm not trying to pick on the company, but it was true in 2010 when I wrote this. What you would end up with is, you know, 20 or 30 or more of the exact same words, you know, being attributed to a different tweeter as a comment on your blog. And if, you know, this, this was actually, uh, it happened to a blog on natural language processing, which is something I find very interesting. And I was trying to dig through all these comments, quote unquote, to find the comments so I could read them. And I, I found it rather exasperating. So I wrote a similarity detector in JavaScript. It is the silliest thing, but it is so, so fast. It just treats tweets as arrays of texts, and then uh, it does... It chops them into, you know, here's a bunch of words. I have an array of words. And then I'm going to do just a little bit of set intersection math, right? Like if the intersection between this array of words and this array of words is 100%, they are identical. You don't need to read them both, right? And actually, I think I set, okay, in this example, it's 100%. But I found that actually, like bringing it down to 75 helped get rid of little things like one person says retweet uh, you know, and then they add a colon, and the other person says retweet, and they put spaces on it. So this, this put this in your browser with .js or something like that. 
Uh, defunct.io slash dot js. Uh, if you use Chrome, it's fantastic. Uh, and this can, this can save you a lot of hassle. So that was 2010. That was uh, the first time I started doing this kind of thing in JavaScript. Uh, later, I created a system with JS Lint. Um, I wanted something that could pull functions out of, uh, out of JavaScript, that could read a JavaScript file and tell you, here are the functions. And there were no parser libraries that I could find at the time. Uh, but JS Lint, I read the source for it by Douglas Crockford. Does everyone know JS Lint? Yeah? OK, good. OK. So just, just in case, just in case anyone uh, doesn't, JS Lint is a linter for JavaScript, logically enough. Just make sure that your code is tidy. Uh, and in the course of doing that, it enforces certain requirements about functions. And so I knew it would have code to find functions. So I took that code, and I literally just threw away everything in JS Lint that was not concerned with finding where functions were. And then I just had it do that little, uh, you know, here a function is an array of text. Is the set intersection 100%? If so, this is duplication in the code base. You can go in and knock it out. Right? And this is just like a really simple scan that you can do. If these functions are identical, it's, it, you know, the rule don't repeat yourself. Uh, it really means that if you have similar code, that you should find a better abstraction that allows you to express similar ideas succinctly. But if you literally have cut and paste code that does not vary, you know, this function in file A and this function in file B are completely identical, then it's just easy. Um, anyway, so it was cool, uh, but it was of limited usefulness. It was still fairly primitive. So then I used a user, uh, I'm sorry, then I used a Ruby parser for JavaScript, and I wrote a system in Ruby. And what this could do is it could actually take a look at console.log foo and console.log bar and say, OK, these things are similar, and they differ by foo here versus bar here. And of course, if you think about my modal Windows example that I started this thing with, it should be obvious to see how this could be useful. Right? And this is basically the problem that I had initially solved in that longer, more involved manner. So this is called Wheatley, because it's a stupid AI. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this character from the video game Portal, but he fits, uh, in my opinion. So I made it in 2011. It's written in Ruby. Uh, it targets JavaScript. Uh, today, I would use a JavaScript parser written in JavaScript, but at the time, the best I could find was a uh, parser written in Ruby. Uh, here's a couple specs from this system. It can actually create a wrapper function, uh, although it is quite, uh, quite hacky. But the spec describes how the Ruby parser decomposes a JavaScript uh, statement down into an abstract syntax tree, this one that you're looking at here. This is what an abstract syntax tree is. Are people here comfortable with the concept of abstract syntax trees? OK, cool. For those of you who have not seen this before, the idea is when you type your code in, the computer turns that into a tree. And that's why you can use arbitrary white space or whatever, because the computer doesn't care. It's only going to see the tree. So you have console.log foo. Right? This is the tree version. Uh, at the top, it's a function call. The name is, you know, it's got a, a string called foo, a dot accessor, linking console and log. And this is a graph. These are typically represented as arrays. So here's, this is some actual code from the, uh, the Ruby thing, and this represents console.log foo. So I'll just, I'll page back for a second. Right, you can see the top function call. So the top of this array is a function call. Uh, yeah, right? And then dot accessor and foo are on the same level. So here's dot accessor and here's foo at the same level. And then console.log splits into console and log nested under the dot accessor. And here that happens also in the list. So it's a list representation of a tree. So obviously, it can do this kind of a comparison, uh, which is actually very valuable. It can even do this, where it finds, in addition to the yellow one being, you know, that it has additional parameters. But 
with a tree, you can actually systematically identify the difference between how many function calls versus how many isolated strings. And you can do all this other stuff, too. So let me zoom in on this. You can wrap function definitions and wrapper uh, functions, identify similar JavaScript code blocks, calculate similarity percentage between any two code blocks based on a particular metric, uh, compare code blocks to see how many specific tokens they differ by. Right? So console.log foo and console.log bar differ by one token, for example. Uh, you can extract those variant tokens. You can extract a literal from a simple function, create function calls, etc. You can do tons of stuff. And it is totally awesome. And by awesome, I mean kind of broken. Uh, it was really hard to build. I I'm studying parsers now, so my next version will probably be better. Um, just to demonstrate this, I'd like to share some of the comments. Uh, this, uh, I can't share this one without breaking the code of conduct. This one is a totally real comment. It says, to do, figure out why I wrote the above comment. So yeah, totally awesome. Uh, but the functionality is kind of awesome, though. right? You can, like this part here, extract the variant tokens by which similar code blocks differ. Right? This is literally this, console.log, pull out the foo and pull out the bar. So the way it does that is, first, it says this variable of variant tokens is equal to, it calls Wheatley parse tree, which is to say, get the tree, parse it and get the tree. And then parse tree is called on console.log foo and console.log bar. So you pass in your JavaScript code block as a string. And once you've done that, you just call this variant tokens method. And that gives you this variable. So then you just say variant tokens should equal foo bar. And it does. And this is just the code that pro proves that it works. Uh, it's very literally this. And you might be wondering about the code that actually demonstrates how it works. Uh, unfortunately, I have no idea. I wrote it in 2011 in, in like a month. It was a frenzy. Uh, and by the way, this feeling is worse when you're the cat who built the Rubik's Cube. Uh, anyway, this, this is actually very hacky code. Um, if you're familiar with Ruby, you know that this is not actually what good Ruby looks like. Uh, and I'm going to tell you right now that if you're fascinated by this, what you should do is learn how it works, but look into JavaScript parsers, because today, the range of JavaScript parsers, we have a lot of different stuff. And this one is probably the one I would look at first. It's Esprima, E-S-P-R-I-M-A dot org. And it gives you a lot of the stuff that Wheatley gives you uh, with, well, A, in JavaScript, and B, uh, with less fuss. And uh, yeah. I, so anyway, this is the basic idea. This is a tree version of it. Here's the console log bar tree. You want to compare these things, blah, 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 blah. It's all about comparing trees. Um, so I might be going too fast here, but I'm also going to tell you about some useful stuff you can do with Git history. So here's a repo. This is worth uh, checking out. GitHub.com slash Giles Bokit slash Rewind. And what this is for is, once upon a time, uh, I wanted to know about the history of a repo. And you might want to know about the history of a repo. Say it's your first day on a new job. Say you're investigating a, uh, a new open source project, or an open source project that isn't that new, but it's new to you. Uh, for instance, you might be curious about uh, the history of Ember.js, right? Maybe you're like, Ember.js looks cool, but it's too alpha. You know, I'm going to wait. And now, now it's almost 1.0. You're like, I'm going to jump in. But maybe I'll examine the history. All right? uh, I'm actually just filling time because I want to make sure that anyone who wants to write this down has the time to. But there you go. GitHub.com, <laughs> Giles Bokit, Rewind. OK. So the story is, in 2012, I did a rescue project as a consultant. And I needed to be able to hit the ground running because we had a t tight deadline and a damaged code base, so it was all about hitting the ground running. So this is the blog post where I open sourced the code that I used to accomplish that, and this is like the beginning of that blog post. Analyzing Git history with Bash. Small library of Git analysis scripts in Ruby and Bash. Uh, its goal is to quickly extract meaningful content, blah, blah, blah. The long story short is that its strength comes from Git history. 
Uh, Git is a functional data structure. You can find out an incredible amount of information because it's all in there. So say you start a new project and you've got a bunch of files. It's very useful to know which files are most important. That's what this whole thing was about. When you get a bunch of code, say, you, say you're like first day on a new code base, you're looking at all this different code and you're like, what, where do I even begin? You know, one thing you can do is take weeks and weeks and weeks to ramp up, or days and days, or hours and hours. But another thing you can do is just have a script that goes in and tells you right away, this file, this one particular file, is the file that people have edited most frequently. Okay, well bam, you know something valuable, right? If it's the file that people have edited most frequently, it's probably the most important file in the system. And if it's the file that people have edited most frequently and it's huge, that's a particular type of problem, right? Not necessarily a fun problem. And if it's a file that people have edited frequently and it's tiny, that probably means it's been really carefully you know, tuned and honed and refactored and all the rest of it. But either way, you want to know which files people are editing most often and, uh, and similar things. So you could actually go through your entire system. Say you've got like terrific specs. You could go through your entire system and just delete files at random and see what breaks. Uh, but there's a better way, and this is that better way. And uh, bringing it full circle, this system of bash scripts actually kicks out a spreadsheet. It pr prints out a CSV, which you can then just like open up in uh, your favorite spreadsheet app I use numbers, like I like numbers on the Mac, but I love numbers on the iPad. Uh, you can do all kinds of crazy pinching and zooming, it's great. So yeah. Um, actually, I've got a little more time than I thought I would. I seem to be sort of like flying through this here. So I'll just show you a little bit of this code and how it works. Okay. One second, I'm just going to switch on mirroring here. Oh, great, it's over there. Oh, no. Ugh. Okay. So up here, you got a function called git history, right? Super easy function, right? It does git log file name, which will get you all the commits for the for a particular file name, and then it pipes that into grep date, right? So grep is a Unix command that uh, you know extracts text uh, lines of text which matches uh, which match the query. Okay, so this gives you a whole list of dates on which a file was edited, right? First commit calls that command git history and passes it into a simple Unix command called tail, and simply uh, tail takes the last thing in a list in this instance. So it simply grabs the, you know, the last thing in the list, and since the list is reverse chronological, it gives you the date of the first commit. Uh, last commit works on a very similar principle. So this becomes really handy when you do it for every file in the code base because you can very easily just glance through your spreadsheet and see which files, you know, it, it is actually very common in a large ongoing project for people to create files, think they're going to need them, and give them really important file names like, you know, strategy pattern. Right? And you're like, oh, this looks important. And then if you have something like this, you can see, oh, except they built it on you know, the, the Monday that they started the project, and then by Wednesday, no one had ever committed it since. You know, that happens. And it'll save you time if you know how to skip through those kinds of files. So this here is a function that just gets the git, the git history. It's called number of commits. And it passes it into wc-l, which is to say word count in line mode, which is to say if you give it a whole uh, bunch of 
text with one line per commit, and you say count the lines, you're going to find out how many commits occurred. This one here is a bit of a nightmare, and I'm going to skip it uh, for a moment. This here is just some code which aggregates it. Uh, I told you the repo, so you can check it out if you want to. Um, this here is pretty cool, though. When you pass it in, you first pass it a directory to scan, and you next pass it any number of dot file name suffixes, right? Which, in other words, means any number of languages, right? So you can scope these things by language. You can say, look at all the JavaScript files by just passing in file stats, directory name, JS, or file stats, directory name, handlebars, you know, or dot coffee, or whatever you want to work with. And it'll then go into the directory and look and give you a separate report, or at least a separatable report, for each of, let me see. Yeah, it does actually give you a separate report for each of the languages. Because you want to be able to scope these kinds of things by language. Anyway, back to the pretty pictures. So yeah, so uh, when you inherit bad code, or you need to refactor code, even if it's good code otherwise, you're here. You want to get at least this far. Uh, being able to automate refactoring means you can get to much better code much faster. And every app, every library, no matter how good or how bad, has opportunities for refactoring. And typically, refactoring is one of those things that can be thought of as, oh, I wish I had time to do that. Or, oh, we're going to put that off until refactoring day, or refactoring month, or refactoring year. But you can make these processes very, very fast. And the faster you make them, the less excuse there is for putting them off. And that's actually a really good thing. You want to make it really easy to write the best code you can. So yeah, fixing bad code is tedious and repetitive. <coughs> tedious and repetitive work is for computers to do. Which leads us to the rather alarming possibility that programmers might be easier to write than we are to hire. Which is good if you are a programmer and you need a programmer to do something tedious and repetitive for you. You can write one as a shell script. It's a little frightening over the long term. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I'll leave you with that terrifying thought. Um, so yeah, that, this is me, uh, if you want to know more. Uh, and I guess I got time for questions. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, when you were first step to your code base, yeah. I'll tell you the big project, and that's a big step to, is there a quicker way to like, maybe like, get started? There is. Uh, OK, so the rewind stuff is, first of all, what you do is you plug your, assuming you have a Git repo, right? Uh, you, you plug it into rewind, and rewind will tell you, these files are the files that are edited most frequently, blah, 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 all that stuff. That can be a useful kind of, it's not like a roadmap, but it's, uh, it's like a compass. It sort of tells you direction. And uh, Wheatley or perhaps uh, some successor project which may come into existence, uh, you could use that to say, find me the very similar functions, right? Go through, like, I have a JavaScript code base. It has 300 files, right? I'm, I'm working on a very large app or, or whatever. Go through here and take all these functions and see if they are similar to each other. Like I've got this file is called lib slash cart, and this file is called app slash models slash cart, right? Find out if they share any functionality and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm getting a time alert, so other questions? Nope, nothing? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>